Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome in once again. Today we're going to have a Maker's Spotlight on William Touch out of Portland, Oregon. The, uh, the sometimes beautiful Portland, Oregon. Those of you that have lived there for a while know exactly what I mean by that. Most beautiful four months in the entire country. And that's it. 72 in a breeze. Beautiful, gorgeous, and then the whole rest of the year you want to slit your wrists. Okay, so that's uh, Portland in a nutshell. What you can't put in a nutshell is who William Touch is. Uh, well, the first time I got a chance to meet Bill it was a couple of years ago at the Guild Show, and we got along famously. We had a great time, got to know each other fairly well, got to hang out quite a lot and talk about a lot of different things. And the funny thing about Bill is he is a rather celebrated and award-winning art knife maker. However, there are a lot of people, especially in the group of collectors that tend to watch my channel in that uh, tactical knife uh, kind of arena, that had just never heard his name. And there's, there's a really good reason why. Um, he, of course, is known in all of the right circles. However, most of the people that buy knives from him tend to keep them. That was one of the discussions that we had when we first met. Uh, most of his collectors are the kind that aren't really on social media. They don't do a lot of buying, selling, and trading. They buy what they want or they have commissioned whatever they want and they keep it forever until they die. He's like, the thing with me is you don't really get to see my knives going up for sale unless somebody's dead. So when there's an estate sale, that's about the only time that you really see uh, any, any amount of touch knives going up for sale. These are the kind of collectors that are, you know, they're very high end. I mean, these are not inexpensive knives by any stretch of the imagination. You're going to spend several thousand dollars to get into these. I think this is one of his least expensive models. Um, and uh, this is called the Axis. And this is right around 2500 bucks, And that's a budget model for him. And we'll discuss why in a few minutes. But, you know, that type of collector really isn't in it for popularity. They're not in it to trade with other people and make buddies in the knife community. You know, this is the level of collector where, you know, they probably own 15 or 20 cars in their garage and they have four or five homes across the world. And, you know, so when they fall in love with knives, they tend to buy them, keep them, maybe they get passed down through generations or uh, the family will then sell them off after they've kicked the bucket. So it, don't be concerned if you haven't really heard Bill's name a lot. Hopefully now that's going to change a little bit. And as you do your research, as you do your Google searches, and you look for dealers that carry William Touch knives, you will see that it's only the higher-end purveyors that carry them. So that will give you another good indication as to the level of his workmanship. He's also a damn funny guy, a hoot to hang around with. And uh, if you ever get a chance to meet him at a show, you, you definitely should take that opportunity. So we're going to go one by one here. We're going to start with what appears to be a fairly basic knife. This is called the Axis. This is his flipper model. Now, flippers, I mean, they're not entirely new to him, but it is a newer segment for him because, as I mentioned, uh, he has built his reputation making very, very high-end art-grade knives. I mean, we're talking about knives that, you know, are going to go for ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, you know, hand-carved steel, mirrored scallops, and what's interesting is you're going to see a little bit of that, a little bit of that fluting, even present in this, what appeared to be at first a very simple flipper, but it's not. Look at how that's been done there. This is all hand carved, by the way. Hand carved, mirror polished, Damascus. Uh, obviously, you've got Damascus bolsters, but hand carved and mirror polished in the Damascus. Beautiful workmanship all the way around. The great thing about this level of workmanship is you, you don't really review it. Uh, because as I mentioned in, in, in other videos, reviewing would mean that, that there must be a critique. There's really no critiquing knives of this level. There just there really isn't. He's doing incredible work all the way around. So let's talk about the specifications. This is a current model that he does offer, so it is one that you would be able to order. What you're looking at here is 7 inches overall with a 3.1 inch blade, 
and that is all hand rubbed satin S30V. It's really a fantastic blade profile and a really fantastic grind as well. It's got a little bit of attitude with the, the top clip and you'll notice the way that's been done. I'm, I'm very, I pay a lot of attention to swedges. I always like swedges as a collector and now as a knife maker uh, I, lo I look at different ways that I can incorporate different styles of swedges into my blade profiles as well. And I love how his just slowly comes in gets nice and fat and then gets narrow again at the tip it is absolutely gorgeous and it's it's the little details like that that really stand out in that art knife world where uh, he has been so you know prevalent now what we're looking at is Chad Nichols blackout Damascus and you're thinking well blackout should it be black yes typically uh, blackout Damascus Hence the name is very, very black. And what Bill has done here is he, he calls it selectively etched. So he's etching it in a manner where he can get a nice, obviously he's had to polish it because if you look, you'll see the top grain is very, very shiny. And then the lower steel is actually almost a matte finish. So what he's done here is he's muted the effect of the blackout. So he's getting the really wicked pattern and you're seeing something that you wouldn't normally see anywhere. Uh, it is writing on caged ceramic bearings and it does have a ceramic detent. Nice detent. It's just sharp enough to make a, a really fast flipper but it's not so hard that you feel like you're gonna break your finger. Really really nicely done. Man You'll also notice it, it has a hidden pivot, so there's no pivot hardware sticking out to, uh, to catch your eye. Now, he didn't do hidden hardware on the bolsters or on the scales, but you're going to see a little bit of hidden hardware trickery on the next knife. Notice also the titanium pocket clip here and the way that he's also carved that as well. So you've got kind of this bark finish and a, a really unique color. It's... I kind of want to call it teal. It's, it's picking up hues of like a seafoam green and shifts to a teal depending on the available light. But there's that beautiful carving and then that's mirror polished. One of the interesting things about Bill is he uses very few machines in his shop. Even though it takes a lot longer, almost everything he does is with hand files and sandpaper. And that's how he's able to get dramatic effects like this. That's all done with hand files. And then he's getting in there with sandpaper, grit after grit after grit after grit after grit, to be able to polish it up like that. You'll notice the inside of the liners are jeweled. Very classy way to do things. And again, he's got kind of that bark finish going all the way around the edge of the liners up into the three-quarter backspacer. Actually, I would call that a one-quarter backspacer. My apologies. Didn't mean to say three-quarter. Every line on this knife is perfect. One of the interesting things when you get into doing hand rub satin, it's very easy to roll over your flats and make everything look a little bit too soft. And you see he's still got some nice definition between the flats and the primary bevel. He's also put a mirrored edge on here as well, which I find uh, pretty interesting. A lot of, uh, a lot of the more high-end makers don't tend to do that. That's more of a, hey, I bought a wicked edge over the weekend and I want to put a mirror edge on my knife. A little small for my hands. Again, 7 inches overall with a 3-inch blade. Um, so it's, it's just a teeny tiny bit small for me. The flipper tab acts as a guard, which is nice, but if the flipper tab weren't there, I could probably climb up a little bit more on the bolster and give myself a little more room. Uh, but it really does feel nice for a small knife. Very snappy action, very smooth, very clean. Oops. And for someone who doesn't traditionally make flippers, I think this is absolutely fantastic. So again, there's uh, just a few of the details of that gorgeous knife. But right now, 
I want to show you guys the Hulk. This one, <laughs> again, when you first look at it from a distance, you may just be thinking, oh, pretty, pretty materials. But it looks somewhat plain otherwise. Well, no. Yes, you see the beautiful Timascus bolsters. You see the, the vintage Westinghouse micarta. And, of course, it's impossible to not see the blackout Damascus. Now, that is what typical Chad Nichols blackout Damascus will look like once it's been etched. But what you're not seeing is beautiful little details like that thumb stud. What you're not seeing, or at least not noticing right away, is the fact that this is totally devoid of hardware. There is no hardware in the dual bolsters, there's no hardware in the scales, there's no hardware in the clip. Everything is internal. Now, again, we've seen that before. Why am I making it sound like that's such a big deal? Because this is not just your run-of-the-mill, everyday, standard knife. It's a dual action. So, it's a dual action automatic with hidden hardware in Blackout Damascus, Timascus, and Vintage Westinghouse with uh, beautifully uh, blued, anodized titanium liners. And notice that, that full-length backspacer. That is a matching piece of Blackout Damascus. It flows as if this was a full tang fixed blade knife. The joints and seams are all nice and clean. Almost can't detect where any of the materials meet. So let's go through that again. We'll push that spring back in so it's a manual. You could obviously flick it open with the thumb stud. It's got a nice action to it. Or there is a hidden release underneath this bolster for the automatic function. And that spring is right there. That's that shiny silver thing that you see right there. So when you factor all of these things in, you're getting into a super premium, high-end custom. Remember, folks, these are all 100% handmade. This is done primarily with files and sandpaper and a hell of a lot of sweat and a lot of patience. He's once again brought some of his file work into the bolsters. One part I particularly loved, and I tried to capture it in photography, but it's hard because you have a very busy pattern in the Timascus. But he has done it there. There you can see it. Beautiful job with the files there. I just love how it just trails off and disappears. It's beautifully polished. Focus. Every little detail is here. This is, if it didn't have a pocket clip and it was a three inch blade, I would call it a gentleman's knife. Uh, but it's so elegant, you still want to call it a gentleman's knife. Let's talk about the specs. Eight inches overall, three and a half inch blade. Hidden hardware, bolster release. Actually, is it scale release or bolster release? Because I'm actually just hitting, there we go. I'm hitting one area. Yeah, it is bolster release. Okay. All right. So where did I leave off there? So hidden hardware, uh, bolster release, dual action, front and back bolsters, all in Timascus. Absolutely gorgeous. I'm a big fan of Westinghouse. Uh, I've, I haven't had a lot of knives with it, only a couple, but I've always been a big, big, big fan. This is done on phosphor bronze washers. It's got a ceramic detent. Oh, yeah. Take a look again at the liners. Jeweled on the inside. Stippled and anodized. Anodized. 
I love this sandwich here. Timascus, stippled, blue anodized titanium, blackout Damascus, the Westinghouse. I mean, this is, this is gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Now, is this a hard use knife? No, absolutely not. These are very elegant representations of a daily carry that you can use for cutting pretty much anything that you want. I mean, there's no limitation to what you could use them for, but you're not going to take a knife that you spent $2,500 and way more and then just start, cut, you know, cutting down cardboard boxes. Can they do that? Yes, absolutely. S30V and, and Blackout Damascus, you don't have any issues of worrying about edge retention or anything like that. You're not going to roll or chip the edge either. However, it's just not the kind of thing that... You, you just you, you don't really want to abuse them that's not what they're made for you know there are a lot of guys that like to pick things apart and go you're not a real knife collector because you don't use them to pry open paint cans and and baton through wood and and carve up deer and kill rabbits and listen everybody has a different use you can use a knife by simply displaying it and enjoying it like a piece of art, like having a piece of art hanging on the wall. It doesn't do anything but hang on the wall, but you bought it for the purpose of admiring it and enjoying it for that. And a lot of times, that is why people buy knives. Now, I know for a fact this one uh, will, because I know who gets it, uh, this one will be carried, but again, it's not going to be abused, it's just going to be carried. It may see some light use, it may cut some envelopes, it may cut some paper, it may, uh, I don't know, it may cut a steak one day. But it's not going to be hard used and abused, because you know what? That's what he has other knives for. When you're in this league and you're buying this level of knife, you're not a, a person that's not a user just because you're not abusing this knife, no you're just not going to carry that knife on it. If you're going to go out in the woods, you spent thousands of dollars on this. This is certainly not the only knife that you own. You're going to grab a knife that's more appropriate for the task at hand. Same thing with me. If I'm going to go out in the woods, I'm not carrying you know that $6,000 Stan Wilson Todd Fisher. No, I'm going to pick something that's a lot more robust something that I don't care if I drop on the ground and I knock around uh, and beat up because I have knives for that. So when you just before you start typing all that crap to people online going, oh, you don't use your knives. I don't see any scratches on it. Maybe they have a different use for that knife than you do. That's all there is to it. Let them enjoy what they enjoy and they'll let you enjoy what you enjoy. Let's talk about the packaging for a quick second. There's not a lot to talk about, uh, but he has these really very high-end, nice uh, leather pouches that he has made for uh, all of these knives. Really beautifully done. Um, you can smell the leather as soon as you open the packaging. It's, uh, it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, really nicely done. Again, classy presentation. One of the things that I found interesting uh, about Bill is the fact that he started out making automatics, started out making switchblades, and he learned from Butch Vallotton. Now, we know the, the Vallotton family, a lot of really amazing, exotic, uh, particularly automatics out there on the market. Um, I don't think that they get as much credit these days as they deserve. You know, at, at, one, at one time, you say the word Vallotton, and that was it. It's like you, you got that on your knees, and, and you, you know, we're not worthy. And nowadays, with this flood of knife makers that are out there, sometimes the greats can be forgotten a little bit. Or maybe not forgotten, but it's like, you know, when you see a Corvette at every traffic light, you're like, eh, it's just another Corvette. And, until you drive one, then you remember, oh my God, just how powerful that car really is for the money that you're spending. Um, so it, it, is, it is certainly worthy of the status that it has earned. And the Velotins are the same way. Yeah, you may, you may see their name all the time, and they may be all over the place with dealers, and you may see them at shows. And Stop and take a look and pick up one of their knives. I've had a chance to sample a lot of their knives, and they are absolutely gorgeous. The attention to detail is, is, is second to none. And they've passed that down through their generations and their family. And uh, cool enough that Butch was able to uh, teach Bill some of the ins and outs on how to do this stuff here. Now, uh, he also hooked up with Tim Herman. If you don't know the name Tim Herman, use Google. I'm not going to get into the whole thing. Um, and he's the one that actually taught 
Bill had to do a lot of the, the file carvings and stuff that he does and convince him to start making art knives. So it's really, really cool to see the people that these great makers learn from get inspired by, and then they take that knowledge and then they, they evolve into something different and they start to spread their wings and do their own things. Uh, Bill only started in 2005. Now, yes, that, that's still a while ago, uh, but you know, when we talk about makers that are able to do this level of work, you know, you're usually thinking you know, 20, 25, 30 year makers. And uh, this just shows the incredible degree of talent that Bill has. And Bill himself now is passing it on as well. I got to meet his son, Eric, when I first met him. And uh, Eric is following in his father's footsteps. He's working side by side with him in the shop. And not just learning, but really doing some incredible work himself. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, that is one name to look out for. And one of the interesting things while I was talking to Eric for a while, is he wants to do something that uh, I was actually suggesting that Bill should start doing, and he's kind of starting to do here, is bring the art knife and tactical knife together. Really, really merge them. And that's something that I, I found from uh, Eric that he wants to do as he uh, forges his own path. Now, he's been doing this for uh, three or four years, uh, working alongside his father, but as he's starting to break out and uh, doing his own thing, I'm really, really, really excited to see uh, what he's going to come up with, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be some pretty cool shit. So anyway, that's just a, a real quick maker's spotlight uh, on William Touch. I'm I'm a big, big fan of his work. I hope now you understand why. I hope now you're you're inspired to go to Google and look at the images and and see the other incredible works of art that he has made. Um, he and I have talked for now over two years about building me a knife. And uh, listen, it, it takes a while, folks. I'm 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 a uh, poor knife maker now, so it takes me a while to be able to spend you know five, six, seven thousand dollars on a knife. But I already have in my mind what I want. Basically, a little larger than this, but going back in more into his art style because I want I want those bolsters uh, carved and fluted with the polishes and the flutes and all that kind of sexiness that we don't see in that tactical market that, that you know we all kind of uh, uh, populate right now uh, when you see this level of workmanship you see the satin finishes and the mirror polishes and listen there's a difference between somebody just making something shiny and somebody that really actually knows what they're doing and creating a true mirror polish. Now, even though he's only using them for accents on this knife, when you hit Google, you're going to see some incredible polishing work that he has achieved over the years. So there you have it, guys. Uh, so again, yeah, I, I have a huge ad admiration for him. I think he's an incredible individual. If you get a chance to meet him at a show, chat him up. Uh, he's kind of a quiet guy at first, break down his wall, and then he gets uh, just as ridiculous as the rest of us. Uh, and he really, really, really loves knives. So definitely hit him up, chat him up a little bit, and, uh, you know, glean a little bit. My apologies for the quick little edit here, but my camera cut me off. Uh, anyway, I just want to say once again, huge admiration for the man. Super awesome guy. His son is going to be a, a major force to be reckoned with in the very near future. So if you get a chance to chat him up, please absolutely do so. Google him. Take a look at the knives that he's made. I'm out of here for now, and I'll catch you on the next video.